Pen Night Radio is proud to bring you Drop a Line, 60-minute interviews with authors, artists, and indie creatives from around the world. We are um, continuing our discussion on brand making, which, again, I hope that you're listening intently to because this is going to become a very important part of your career if it has not already. I'm very, very excited to talk to our guest this morning, who is an app, an expert on brand making and has a very powerful and informative message to share with us. And I really hope you enjoy this, this interview. This is Drop a Line. These are the stories behind the stories. And we are live. Welcome. Hello. Thank you for having me. (laughs) I'm so glad. I'm so excited to talk to you. For those of you that do not know, I was recently a a guest on a podcast by MC Basil, known as the Golden Quill. Had a terrific uh, time on the podcast. And I met our guest uh, today there. And I'm very excited to continue our conversation because I feel like we discussed it quite a bit last time. So um, I was very, very excited when you agreed uh, to join us for the podcast. Would you um, uh, like to introduce yourself to the audience? Absolutely. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Michelle Monaves. Um, I am a sci-fi author. I'm a Mexican-American writer. And I'm currently living in the borderline between El Paso, Texas and Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. Um, and I was very excited to be able to be here with you today uh, and talk a little bit about branding. Uh, branding was one of the topics that took the longest for me to learn, uh, but now I think I can talk circles around it. I've been told that I have a very concise brand. It has not yes. been easy. So um, I would like to share some of the lessons I learned along the way with you today. Oh. Absolutely, absolutely <laughs> wonderful. Um, it, would would you mind if I shared something from your uh, Instagram page? No, absolutely. Go ahead. So it's it, and is it Monterez? Uh huh. That's right. correct. Okay, I just want to make sure make sure uh, mind my pronunciation. Um, if you go to Michelle Monterez's page, you see her name, Michelle Monterez, and uh, right next to that, you see sci-fi. And then under that, you see author writing sci-fi and superhero books that bring Hispanic heritage to American settings for uh, BIPOC readers. Your sci-fi adventure starts here. And you have a wonderful finger point to your um, links, which I think is just astounding. Um, So I really wanted to share that because you said in your intro that um, that you have you have you have just a knockout brand and. Man, I just wanted to let that settle over the audience for a minute because it really is just a fantastic example of branding. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. So everywhere that I do go, um, whether it's my social media or my uh, website um, or even um, the media that I have uh, to give out, like business cards and things like that, from the minute that you get it, uh, you will know that I am a sci-fi author and that my brand is a bilingual brand. Um, that is also part of, since we're bringing Hispanic heritage to American settings, um, the bi- being bilingual, English and Spanish is a must. So uh, it's pretty, pretty interesting there. It is, it is. And I definitely wanna um, get more into that as our conversation goes on. First, I wanna just, um, re- uh, revisit a story I told in the first segment really quick. Um, it went something like this. I'm a college student. I am trying a bunch of stories for classes, not sure which one is going to work, not sure what I'm going to publish, not sure if I'm going to publish. And then all of a sudden I write a horror story that the teacher really likes. And I decide that that's going to be my first book. Somebody comes to me and says, well, what do you do? I say, um, I wrote a horror book. And then at a uh, meeting, somebody tells me, Alec, I want to build you a brand. I say, that's awesome. 
what is a brand? So I know from personal experience that this can be, um, you know, brand making for me, the challenge can be first just figuring out who it is that you are, what it is that you want to say, what it is, um, is your relationship to art. And I feel like a lot of people just genuinely might not know what brand building is. Um, do you think that's the case? I do think that's the case. That was my experience as well. Um, I went through something very similar uh, in college when we learned about branding. It was um, not very clear to me. Uh, and I see a lot of people made the same mistake um, as I did, uh, which is show your book as your brand. Um, mm. And that's, I think, mistake number one. Or choose a handle on social media that has nothing to do with your name. That's definitely a mistake that I made. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because I didn't know what branding was. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So I, those are two points that I'm really excited to talk about, you know, <laughs> and that's why I love talking to you because every time you answer a question, you just, you just bring us right, right to the meat of it. So um, let's start actually with that last point you brought up. Why is it a mistake to start by branding yourself by the name of your series? So it's a mistake because people don't know who you are. Um, they, this is gonna sound very harsh, but this is this comes from Monique Mensa, one of my mentors. Um, nobody cares about your book because they don't know who you are. Um, and it sounds really harsh, but it's true. Um, so I think that's why it's a mistake because since people yes. don't know who you are, uh, they they haven't read your book. Maybe this is your first book. Maybe this is your tenth book. But if you don't have like a consistent audience already, uh, people will not care about the name of a series. Uh, mm -hmm. Much less, they will not be able to connect with you um, because most likely what you are going to be doing is that you're going to name your social media after your series or your book. And you're going to have pictures of the book, like the cover um, or character art and things like that. But your face is nowhere to be seen. And mm -hmm. that is harder to help your audience connect with you. There's a disconnect with your audience. They don't know who you are. They don't know what your, what your book is about. And they really don't care. When they see a human being attached to the account, they're more, more likely to care. So that's why it's one of the mistakes. Absolutely. And just to piggyback off of that, when I started, all of my sales were made initially were made in person. Mm -hmm. um, I, did, I had no idea how to get an online sale and I wasn't getting any online sales. And even in person at a book signing, unless I really, you know, talked to somebody and shook their hand and answered questions and talked a little bit about why I chose to write that particular book, I really uh, didn't get a sale. You know, I noticed that it's very tempting for people to just say, hey, can I grab the business card? Because, you know, that's what I would do. If I don't want to spend money, I'll just grab some information and decide later. But when I was able to really explain the why, uh, my why to somebody, um, you know, every now and then you're able to, you're able to find that point of interest that they mm -hmm. might have, right? That's right. Um, that's connection. Mm -hmm. So be beyond just being a brand, um, you have to offer some value to your audience. And that value is not your book. Your book is going to be your product. But the value that you add is, like you said, your why. Mm -hmm. Having your audience connect to your why is the value that you add because you're giving them something that they're already looking for. Yes. And here's a brain te teaser, tweezer, my goodness. Here's a brain teaser. Uh, <laughs> and to top it off, I'm a, I'm a teacher of ELA. <laughs> so oh. yes. So uh, let's, let's see if I know how to talk, but um, for a brain teaser, is branding something that can be done during the drafting process or does it have to wait until uh, the author is ready to publish? No, I think it's something that you should be doing even before, um, even before you, <laughs> you have a book idea. Like you can do it at, at any time. When you are ready to publish, I feel like that's already a little too late. 
Mm. Um, and I will tell you why. When you're ready to publish, if you don't have an audience already behind you, it's going to be hard to land sales. Um, you want people to be excited about your book. You want people to be following. You want people to be waiting for your release date. And it's really hard to do that when you don't have an audience already, when you don't have a brand already. So well, you what you will see a lot of authors doing, especially in the indie game, is that they either have a podcast or they offer some sort of value in a different way. Um, many nonfiction writers do this. They have either programs or they have they offer videos of tidbits um, with advice or things like that in order to build their audience. And then when the book comes out, they have a bunch of sales. They have tons of sales because they already built that brand and that brand connect them to an audience that's already waiting for those books. Yes. I first published in 2017 and I was completely unknown. I had 200 people that I knew on Facebook, 200 people comment on my announcement that I was finally published. I had 200 congratulations. I yeah. did not have 200 sales. Exactly. And that, that was the beginning of a very long and painful learning process over the past several years. Yes. I mean, same. Um, 2020, 2020 was my um, release date uh, or my release year. And I was, I already had an account over social media, but I didn't have a lot of followers. Mm -hmm. um, and I also didn't know what I was doing when it comes to my brand. Like I wasn't sure where I wanted my brand to go or what I wanted it to be. So I didn't have a lot of sales the first, um, that first year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it, took, we, yeah. it took a lot. Mm -hmm. Right. So when you hear somebody say, this is, I'm speaking to the audience. When you hear somebody say, nobody cares about your book, right? Um, as Michelle was saying, it may sound harsh. The way they said it to me was nobody cares about your dead grandma. Um, <laughs> yes, that's what I was told in the beginning, because that's something that I might be writing about. They said, nobody, and I mean, nobody cares about your dead grandma. But to back up Michelle's points and the points that we're making from experience, the next thing they said was they care about their dead grandma. Yes. They, they care about how your story can connect with them, why it can offer value, as, as you said, perfectly said, offer value to their lives. Um, and it can be challenging work to learn how to write for a reader versus just writing for ourselves. When would you say was the first time you really learned how to write for a reader? So... I think I still don't write for my readers. I still write for myself first um, because I take myself back to a time where I needed what I'm offering in my books. Mm. Um, and that's how I write. And so it happens that readers connect with that. Um, so to tell you the truth, I don't write for my readers, I write for myself first. And then from there, I try to think of the situations and where, like, why why was I looking for certain things that my brand offers? For example, I offer representation uh, for Hispanic and Latinx folks, uh, people of color. And uh, I take myself back growing up and seeing uh, white media. And thinking back on what 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 I was missing, why I wasn't able to why wasn't I able to connect with certain stories, um, or why were those stories making me reject my own heritage? Um, and then you open a kind of worms there, and it's like, what maybe if I had had representation in media, I would have been able to connect better with um, with stories or with characters, I would have been able to feel proud of my own heritage um, instead of trying to hide it. And that's what helps uh, thinking of a time when I needed what I'm giving out today. Amazing. Yes. And that is, um, I agree with that 100%. Thank you for sharing that. And that actually really aptly brings us into our next segment. Drop a Line is a platform that um, you know, I've been saying since the beginning, you know, this is a grab a coffee, put your feet up on the desk, 
lounge back and just chat normal show. So um, <laughs> we're going to continue discussing branding. But first, I would love to learn uh, for the audience to learn a little bit more about you. Um, you told us a little bit already um, some connections you made back to childhood. But let's let's get even more into it. Like, when was the first time you realized the talent that you had? Oh, man. Um, I guess I was 15 and I had already decided, I decided when I was 12 that I wanted to be an author when I grew up. Wow. Um, and at 15, it was my first time pursuing a workshop and I was in back in Mexico, uh, pursuing this writing workshop. And, uh, I had been in that workshop for about a year without many results because, you know, we all suck when we first start writing, you could be 15, you could be 30 years old. If it's the first time that you're writing, uh, probably everything that you're doing feels a little off, a little weird. Uh, you don't really like it. Um, and I remember turning in a story and one of the professors reading a line and saying, here it is. This is your voice. This mm -hmm. is what you need to do. And at the time, I didn't understand what he meant. Uh, voice is another thing that's really hard for every writer that I've met, it's they have told me that come, finding their voice has been one of the hardest things to do. And it, he didn't explain it to me. He didn't explain like, this is what you're doing. And that makes me think that this is what you're, what's gonna make your writing unique to you. Uh, he just said, this is it. And I, I asked him for clarification. He was like, no, you'll, you'll find it. You'll figure it out once it's mm -hmm. time, but here it is you you just found it so i think that was the first time that i said like oh uh, i actually can do this uh, mm -hmm. i just need to figure out this voice thing um so yeah that was the first time <laughs> huh and go you know going forward from that um how soon did you figure out um what he was referring to i think it took it took me a long time to figure mm -hmm. it out i think it took me all the way to college Okay. Um, so I went to SNHU, um, they have a creative writing program and life just changed a lot between 15 and college. Um, first of all, I wasn't in Mexico anymore. I had immigrated to the United States. I had had to learn English. I've been speaking English for less than a decade. And, um, and I was in college when I finally realized, oh, this is what my voice should sound like. Um, mm. My voice is not different, it's funny enough. It's not different in English. Um, I just didn't recognize it when mm -hmm. I started writing in English. Uh, yeah. Right, I can, I can understand that, yeah. <laughs> um, fascinating. Um, and a cautionary tale for teachers, you know, kids are hungry, are hungry to know when you, especially when you say something so important, so dense, we want to yeah. know, no, 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 give us something, give us a compass bearing. What do you mean? This is my voice. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was really interesting. Um, I had two teachers on that workshop. One of them was really sweet. Uh, you know, we had the good cop and the bad cop in, the, in that mm -hmm. class. And the bad cop was the one that told me like, no, you need to figure it out. And he just let me out to draw, draw, <laughs> you know, fancy, trying to figure it out. I I appreciate it, but of course, uh, maybe uh, I could have used a little bit of help. <laughs> right, right, yeah. I mean, um, on the podcast, we talk a lot about how without the proper help that you know this podcast and many others try to provide with their listeners, um, it can be just years and years of trial and error before you mm -hmm. finally find that one key ingredient that just, you know, pushes you so much further ahead. So, um, but yeah, no, I mean, such as you are, you know, you have, um, uh, thrived since then. And we'll definitely talk about that. Yeah. Do you, does your writing have any, um, um, inspirations or influencers? Um, I think so. I think, uh, I am an influential writer. Um, I, I think I have a lot of um, magical realism in my books, even though I write sci-fi, um, I find myself using magical realism as a tool. Um, I read descriptions or I read certain images that I've written and I think like, oh, this is this is magical realism. And that comes from my upbringing. I grew up reading um, 
you know, Isabel Allende, Gabriel García Márquez, um, eh, Carlos Fuentes, like I grew up reading um, Hispanic authors. So I think that's where that influence comes from. Um, then there's also, funny enough, funnily enough, um, Stephen King. Uh, Stephen King is not my favorite author. He, in mm -hmm. fact, uh, I have a lot of issues with the way that he writes. Mm -hmm. um, but for some <laughs> reason, I've been told that I write very similarly to him. Like the mm -hmm. length of the sentences and the way that I tell a story, um, I've been told that it sounds like him. But I don't know if that's a compliment mm -hmm. or not. <laughs> I hope yeah, it's a compliment. I mean... um, but it, it's, I think I've been influenced by reading his vein of horror in his uh, style of uh, prose. So. Sure. I mean, for somebody who <laughs> seems to shell out a book every year, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's I definitely mean, across. I, I would dare say she shells like three to five books every You're year. Right. You're right. It, I keep forgetting that. <laughs> I am very jealous. I wish I was like him on that sense, but I'm not. Oh, please. Me too. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just going to say, I, I think that for someone who shells out so much, it's highly possible that you know, some of it might agree with us while others are like, this is a, a bit this of a reach weird. here. <laughs> yeah, it, it's impossible that everything that he writes is going to be good. Uh, but I really admire his um, way to tell a story and, mm -hmm. you know, to just be completely sure of what he's writing and being like, yeah, I'm just going to, this is ready. This is as good as it's going to be. And I'm just going to put it out there. Um, Chapter so one is going to be all car engine sounds. <laughs> I'm going to write vroom, vroom, motor, motor, you know, I mean, and I, I absolutely adore personally, uh, misery. The novel oh, it was, one, yeah, it was one of the fastest, uh, reads I've ever, it was one of the fastest I've ever read a big book. You know, I was just flipping yeah. through those pages and I, re I reference it a lot when I talk about my influences, but every now and then I flash back to, did he really just do car sounds on the first page? <laughs> I think he did. <laughs> it, it, it's true. I mean, it's, I, I I think that he's very experimental. Um, mm -hmm. But going back to your question about influences, I think that now um, I'm more influenced by people like Silvia Moreno Garcia. Um, mm -hmm. If you haven't read Mexican Gothic, please do do yourself a favor and read mm -hmm. Mexican Gothic. Um, it's it's an amazing book and it's it's very fresh, very different. And I really like how she writes about her own heritage. Uh, she's also Mexican. I admire her career a lot and I admire the way that she writes. Um, and I think I'm heavily influenced by her right now. Mm -hmm. And just to piggyback off of that, I typed in M-E-X into Google and that was the first thing that came up <laughs> was Mexican Gothic. So that tells you something right yeah. there. My if you're goodness. a fan of horror and you want some fresh horror, do yourself a favor and read it. Oh, I might have to do that now. Um, awesome. Thank you for sharing uh, that with us. Now, since we've talked about your influences and your voice, um, can you share anything with us about uh, what your stories are about? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I have two books out there. Um, the first book is called Refurbished the Clover Initiative. It's a story about superpowered in immigrants. Um, so there's a story of two immigrants that uh find themselves to be engineered to have superpowers in exchange for um uh, green cards so that's um that tells you a little bit about what i write uh, i write a lot about chosen family uh diaspora and representation of immigrants first generation um latinos and latinas and latinas and the second book is called Fabulous Texas. That book is about first generation Latinx people. Um, mm -hmm. I That one is a lot about family. Um, it's about a town that disappears uh, out of thin air after a violent crime affects the community. Is a tiny town in Texas in 1980s. And you get to find out what happened to a town through the story of Anita Padmore, uh, who is the protagonist of the story. So yeah, um, a lot about uh, Hispanic representation and the diaspora. I think I also write a lot about language uh, being and language barriers. 
Mm. There's there's always going to be that element, I think, in my stories. Mm. I love that. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this next question. You know, um, maybe I should just maybe I should just put it out there. In your experience, what is the importance of representation in the Mexican and Latinx uh, communities? Yeah. You just open Pandora's <laughs> box. Um. <laughs> but this is, like I said, this is a free, uh, a free speaking platform. So please. <laughs> so um, from my experience, the importance of Hispanic and uh, particularly for me, at least from, from Mexican representation um, and even just other Hispanic communities uh, is to be pretty much seen as human beings. Um, we have always been um cast casted as um you know the villains the narcos the drug pushers the cholos and there's there's a lot more to us than that mm -hmm. um i would like to to open <laughs> um my readers minds to that um or so that they can see themselves represented as something more uh so what i look for pretty much is to represent people as heroes and not, you know, drug dealers, uh, <laughs> which mm. is, uh, I think that's the importance of representation in media, it's particularly for marginalized communities. Um, the more you see something, the more you, mar you, the more you normalize it, the less likely you are to demonize it. Um, mm. And as we all know, um, Mexicans and other minorities are the first ones to be um blamed for certain things um demonized for certain problems in mm -hmm. the country mm -hmm. <laughs> particularly in the country mm -hmm. and that's a lot because of, of media um so mm -hmm. i think that's why it's important yeah no thank you for sharing that with us and i couldn't agree oh. with you more i um you know uh, living the life that I did, you know, I would say up until about, you know, 2016, when, you know, uh, political issues really began to be just, you know, thrown at you from every direction um, due to uh, a couple of loud mouths. If I could keep them, <laughs> if I could keep them nameless. Um, we all understand. <laughs> I, I, yeah, seriously. I really went for a long portion of my life in total ignorance. And mm -hmm. what I started to learn about what I started to learn about, you know, diversity and representation in media is that it can make a story so much richer in so oh, many yeah. ways. I Absolutely. mean, we have so much culture to share. We have so many, um, you know, we have so many stories to share. Learning about the about the struggles of another person that you haven't experienced can just really give you a much clearer image of the world and you know like the the foundation that you're standing on i mean there's just no end to to what you can learn and how we can all like kind of mutually benefit in my opinion and that's why it is so wild to me that to this day there's always those faction factions of people that will stop at nothing to beat back any any um, suggestion of change or of of dismantling toxic parts of culture. You know, they, there's just such resistance. It's like their go-to, and there's a lot that I could say on that, but it really does boggle my mind. I think that comes a lot from um, not having enough social studies and yeah. literature studies, particularly books teach you about empathy mm. and it's without it i know that math and science is important believe me i i love math and science i am a science fiction author after all um but those uh, assignments are also important um we because we need to learn about other humans and about other mm. people and it, i love individualism it's a uh, it, it it's it's a great thing but also uh, we need to learn where the line is at where instead of being individualistic you become selfish mm -hmm. and i think books can teach you about that so absolutely the first time i wanted to write something that was you know vulnerable 
something that was really going to kind of put me out there in a way that, you know, I wasn't too sure about. I was very scared. I was mm -hmm. just very scared, like kind of locked up, tense, didn't really, you know, want to talk much about it, but knew that I had to like, mm -hmm. so, um, you know, you write about some pretty serious stuff. Has, has this ever been the case for you? Yes. Um, I think every book I put out there has had some of that issues. Um, particularly, especially with the books that I write in the future, um, fiction becomes reality hmm. before I published my book. Uh, for example, the uh, harsh immigration practices that we saw in 2016 and even a little bit before that, the separation of families and things like that. Uh, that's what happens to one of my characters in my first book. Mm -hmm. And um, I wrote it as what is the worst thing that could happen in, you know, in immigration? What is the worst thing that the United States could do uh, whenever receiving people from other countries? And then it became real. Um, so I was really nervous to put that out there because mm -hmm. not only because it was already happening, but because there was such a big support of it um, mm -hmm. or such a no one. No one wanted to talk about that mm -hmm. um, when, you know, like the protest of families belong together and all of that mm -hmm. started. People wanted to shut it down and I was really nervous to put my book out there because I touched on those issues. Mm -hmm. No, I can imagine. No, and I commend you for for choosing to do so. <laughs> what kind of response did you get? Uh, mostly positive. Um, I did get some nasty uh, emails <laughs> mm -hmm. from a couple of people, you know. Uh, but I, I think that was a compliment. It means that my work here is done. I made you uncomfortable, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm mm -hmm. here for. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if yeah. You don't feel you... anything at the end of reading my books, then I didn't do my job right. Yeah. I mean, the principle that, you know, I go by lately is, well, listen, if, if, if the truth bothers you, mm -hmm. I can't, I can't let that be my problem. Thank you. That. No, <laughs> Thank no, you it, it, it's not, uh, <laughs> it's not, it's not my problem, but thankfully the response was really positive. Um, so people like stood behind it. They liked it. Um, and they have told me that it, Miguel de Santos is their favorite character. Um, a lot of people have told me that. So that's yeah. amazing. So not only <laughs> did you, so not only did you put yourself out there and put the stories out there, but you created a favorite character. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> and that is awesome. I am very proud of that. Uh, that's not what I was expecting, but you know, I'm happy. <laughs> and how? And how did? And, but we never expect that, right? On the no. on the on this side of fear, we never expect that. Mm -hmm. And how has that changed your perspective since then? It has made me I'm a lot more confident than talking about uh, my heritage is okay. Uh, because that that has also been a process. It has been a process of decolonization and uh, check my internalized racism and check my um, internalized issues with uh, wanting to assimilate to the American culture. Um, and that that has been really positive because that just cemented the idea that it's okay to be different. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I am um, just elated that, you know, you took that step and that you've made your books real. Um, while we were talking, I happened to, to peek and I see that you are a five-star reviewed author uh, with a good number of ratings. So that is also very impressive. And I hope you'll forgive me, but I just had to go and look and now I want to ask you about first sentences because your Ooh. first sentence, <laughs> yes. I, I'm going to buy and read it cover to cover. Uh, I okay, promise cool. you that, uh, that is, wow. Uh, I want to ask you, how do you write a first sentence? <laughs> so first sentences, I think the first sentence of your book is the most important sentence you're going to write. It's your presentation card to your readers and it has to be strong. It's like, sure. You can have a hook, and um you can That's probably right. have a, a great hook i'm sorry about that That's okay no problem <laughs> um you can probably have a good hook and uh, that's probably going to be your first paragraph but you're not going to get readers to read beyond that first paragraph if you don't have a good first line mm -hmm. um so i think 
the best advice that I can give about how to write a first line is how do you want your readers to perceive the whole book? The whole tone of the book has to be good. part of your first sentence. Um, if your book is going to be dark, such as mine is, um, then your first sentence needs to be dark. And um, yeah. So I think that's the best advice that I can give you. You need to actually feel it as well. Um, mm -hmm. Be proud of that first sentence mm -hmm. and before you publish. Mm -hmm. Mine drove me absolutely nuts <laughs> on the last book that I put out. Um, I didn't put a lot of thought into it in uh, the my debut novel, Barker's Rules. My debut novel talks about the weather on um, uh, se the weather in September. Uh, nobody's complained about it yet, so maybe maybe yeah. that was a mood, mood setter. I don't know, but, yeah, but... It's a brain mood setter. I I am yeah. full, fully behind writing about weather. Mm -hmm. I know that it was a dark and stormy night is uh, <laughs> has made it really hard for people to write about weather um, in their books, but I I fully support it. It's uh it's important and it it makes your readers imagine the scene. So. I, I support it. <laughs> there you go. Well, in my case, it was a total fluke. But um, I tell you, I'm reading your first sentence here. And literally, I, I would just love to, right after this interview, just read the entire book. I mean, I'm like, I, I'm over here. I'm like, he did what? He kept what? Where? Wait, let me read that again. I read it three times before I read the second sentence. I'm like, oh boy, I like this. This is going to be good. <laughs> I might I might tell you a little story about that first line. Um, this is. This comes from a little bit of personal experience. So when I was growing up, um, my dad had a skull, uh, an actual human skull that a friend from medical school gifted him. Mm. And that was always, I was always terrified of it. So it comes oh. from there. <laughs> <laughs> As one might be. <laughs> I love it. You know, we yeah. got all these Christmas movies where like, you know, I was just watching Home Alone the other day and Kevin McAllister, he's afraid of the uh, heater in the basement, but he that's yeah. a normal thing. But I, I I think it's reasonable to be afraid of a, of a, a live skull. <laughs> yes, yes it, was, uh, it was interesting. I don't know. He kept it because he said, like, it, it's, it's just cool. Like, uh, it brings me a lot of memories. It was a friend that gave it to me. I'm like, well... <laughs> I wish we just stopped at friend, right? It brings yeah. me a lot of memories. This was a friend. <laughs> <laughs> that would be good. Just let that settle. Just let that settle on people. I know, for the right? Next 10 I, years. Know. <laughs> so, I know. Oh, that is that's great. That, that'd be great if I were to write dark comedy. That, that'd, uh -huh. be a, that'd be a great first line. <laughs> hey, you know, that's what we try to do on Pen Night Radio. We try to support the creative process. So that is fabulous. Are you enjoying your time here so far? I am. I am. Thank you Good. so much. Wonderful. Yes, this is a this is a uh, very uh, casual, professional, but casual program. And we try to learn as much about you as possible. So, um, so we learned a lot about the why behind your brand making. You know, you were you were kind enough to share um, some very vulnerable um, things and personal history. Um, but now I'm curious, once you began the process of brand making, did you get it right the first time or was oh, there no. a, <laughs> like, yeah, like what kinds of bumps can people who are starting to do this expect? I think um, you need to do a lot of soul searching. I know it sounds a little corny, but it's true. You need to do a lot of soul searching why are you doing what you're doing um so my why is decolonize the avengers i put mm -hmm. it down to a sentence and that is my my why i want superheroes to be more diverse basically mm -hmm. uh, we're getting there we're getting there i know that uh, franchises are doing that a little bit better but um mm -hmm. when <laughs> the avengers first became a thing they they were pretty pretty white okay. um so i that's what I boiled my why to. And I had to do a lot of soul searching. What's the reason behind me wanting to see um, diversity in the superhero genre and the fiction and the science fiction genre? Um, what, what brought me to that idea? How did it feel when I didn't have that? And it wasn't a perfect process. Nothing ever is really. But branding for me was extremely difficult, uh, extremely difficult because I, I think 
<laughs> a part of me didn't want to put myself out there completely. Um, I did. Basically, I did everything that most of my mentors told me to do. Uh, most of my mentors before, when I was in college, for example, um, or when I first started writing in the United States, they had told me to not show myself so much. Uh, they suggested that I used a pen name and um, that I didn't use the written accent in my last name. Um, they suggested that I pretended to be a man, um, you know, like many female authors do, mm -hmm. uh, because science fiction is pretty much still a boys club, uh, a little bit there. And they suggested that, you know, I played it safe and didn't, maybe didn't rock the boat too much and didn't publish about immigration. Um, and I did completely, the complete opposite of everything that they mm -hmm. told me to do. Um, yeah. So it was really hard to get that down, to find mm -hmm the why I wanted to do it and how did that why it was gonna translate into a brand. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, I think I got it. It was, it was hard to figure out who I was with what I was writing and the message I wanted to give. So how does Michelle translate into sci-fi was the hardest part. And I think that is probably what people are gonna have the harder time with how does you translate into the genre that you're writing? And you need to be sure about your genre. You need to commit to a genre. Um, before, I didn't want to commit to a genre. I thought I might go back to fantasy, maybe. So I would say that I wrote speculative fiction. And that's great and dandy. But it didn't make sense. In the end, it didn't make sense for me. I don't think I will ever go back to fantasy um because i haven't written written fantasy in over 15 years <laughs> mm -hmm. so it's it's important that you commit and once once you do that you can truly build your brand commit to your genre commit to your why and commit to how you want to translate that message to your audience yes yes and just to add uh, one quick follow-up to that we mentioned stephen king earlier one of the essays he wrote one of the introductions he wrote it, this one was in the gunslinger the first dark tower book um, was very inspirational to me. He talked about how he had suffered some um, uh, writer's block on account of his doubt. He wanted to write a fantasy himself, but he couldn't see himself doing it any better than his hero, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. And mm -hmm. he just he just felt like the world had enough dragons, plains, mountains, fields, elves, hobbits, dwarves. He just felt like the world had enough and there wasn't much for him to add to that. So for a while, he just wasn't even entertaining the idea of, of writing this story that he was burning to write. But then he watched a very famous Western movie and he figured out how to bring two genres together to create his vision for how this fantasy would go. And that that totally, you know, set him free as an artist. He wasn't trying to be better than somebody. He wasn't trying to do his Lord of the Rings. Any some of the traps we fall into when we're young, um, not to speak for anybody else. But he said that, you know, he learned what it really means to create something original when he figured that out. And that just set me free reading that, you know. Um, but I think it serves as, you know, a great addition to your point, which is, yeah, you can totally invent your own genre if you've got uh, the thought to do that. But you're absolutely right. We do need to commit. We need to be able to stay on message and make sure that we can, you know, not paint with such a broad brush because I've been painting with a broad brush for years and I've recently been starting to figure out. Yes. I don't think my followers really know what from me they want to read yet. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's the problem. So. You know, it happens. It's, it's hard to commit to a single genre because when you start mm -hmm. writing, the world is your oyster and we're experimenting, right? Like I experimented with a bunch of genres, even nonfiction and poetry, which woof, that was, bad um <laughs> it that was a season of my life i wouldn't like to relieve um but it was um it was i don't know sci-fi has, has always been there i just didn't see it for some reason um mm. so maybe your brand is going to be where you least expect it 
Absolutely. And uh, that brings me to my next question, which is, what is it about sci-fi? <laughs> For me, um, I had another interviewer tell me once that I probably should have been an astronaut. And I just wasn't mm. good enough with numbers. But I think I would have liked that. I think I would have liked to be out there. Um, I've always been fascinated by space and how mm. things work out there and the stars, the uh, black holes. I think the first time that I fell in love with sci-fi was probably watching Treasure Planet. Um, okay. If you haven't watched it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, do yourself a favor and watch it. And Atlantis was another good one. Um, yep. I, think, I didn't even think the, of them as sci-fi, but what else are they? They're mm -hmm. pirates in space in a lost civilization. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> sci -fi. Um, and I think that is had that became a safe safe place for me. Um, a look to the future and um, what we could accomplish if you know, we had something happen, like we had better technology or we had better this or better that, um, and how society would react to that. I think that I have always found that really interesting. And that's it right there. You know, it, it, it makes sense from a listener's or reader's perspective when you say it like that, you know, as someone who's writing about representation, who wants things to get better for marginalized communities, for Mexican mm -hmm. and, and, and Hispanic Americans, um that's what we do we look to the future and that's what you do in sci-fi is you look to the future so yeah. yeah no i can see it they come together quite well actually i think that's very impressive yeah it's uh it's it's the whole point of the genre i think the whole point of uh i think uh, everything that happens in the past historical fiction and things like that the, the point of those genres is to learn from the mistakes that we made sci-fi is what will happen if we don't learn from those mistakes or from mm. what we're doing right now? So it's a, it's an important genre. I love that. I love it. And I'm not trying to put you into a box because I don't <laughs> put people okay. in boxes. But for uh, the curious reader, when we read your science fiction, is it like, um, you know, Interstellar where we get this, you know, this beautiful uh, rendition of a rocket and this long arduous process realistic process of breaking off into space and getting rid of gravity and losing part of the ship and going you know light years into the future or is it more like star wars where there's no suits there's uh there's gravity in space you hop on a ship and you take off easier than you do from an airport and you're in space hello <laughs> well, in so, general, which way do we lean more towards? It's actually quite different. Um, all nice. my sci-fi is Earthbound. Um, nice. We haven't gone to space yet. I always say that I don't think I'm going to go to space with my books, but who knows? Maybe I will. But for now, everything is Earthbound, um, is genetics and mm. um, alien technology, alien invasions, things like that. But everything happens mm. on Earth. Oh, that sounds fun. That sounds right up my alley, honestly, because um, in fact, in the um, I don't have a copy on me, but in the Meridian trilogy, uh, the first of which is Barker's Rules, it is a horror, but um, it's all about a um, mutated human who is who was holding a young girl prisoner. And the reason that he thinks he can do that is because of his mutation, because he thinks being superhuman means that he can do whatever he wants. So, oh. and, and down the road, there is a research lab and the idea of injections and experimenting with this strange mutation does come into play later. So that is right up my alley. Honestly, <laughs> I'm, I'm all about genetics and alien invasions. Uh, yeah, let's have it. <laughs> yeah, no, me too. Uh, one of my favorite sci-fi is, uh, happens in space, but funny enough, I don't write in space. I don't know. Um, the murder bot series, it all happens in mm. space, but it has an element of genetics and things like that. So right. I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, it's the same for me. Um, I was, um, I was just thinking about this the other day. What, what was it? Um, I was very, I'm very, uh, influenced by like Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter. Um, those were some of the, you know, my, my very important pieces when I was young. And, you know, you've got wizards, you've got elves, you've got orcs, you've got all this stuff. 
But while um, my second series, The Calipar, which is more of a fantasy, while that definitely dabbles into those themes, it really doesn't dress itself the same way as those stories. And I'm kind of comfortable with the idea of, listen, these things really inspire me, but I'm not trying to just do what I saw where I'm trying to create something out of that, you know, yeah. something new. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, um, I don't know. It's, it's interesting to me to see stories of what ifs in earth. What mm -hmm. if we survived an almost successful alien invasion mm -hmm. and got technology that could alter genetics and things like mm -hmm. that. Oh, that is awesome. I can't wait. Honestly, you know, one of the th one of the things that I love about Pen Night Radio is that I can meet an author and all of a sudden I have a new book uh, coming in the mail uh, because <laughs> I, I swear um, I need to be reading your books like yesterday. Um, thank you. Very kind. Oh, please, please. Thank you for, for, for coming on. Um, what is something that you really urgently would want the audience to know that we haven't uh, uh, covered yet? Something urgently that I would like the audience to know. Hmm. Or so, so something that's important. Something that's important. Let me think. Um, of course. And while you do, you folks are listening to Pen Night Radio. We usually do this about 30 minutes in. But since we've been having such a marvelous discussion, we are 50 minutes in. And I am reminding you, you are listening to Pen Night Radio, where we slay our personal demons and arm ourselves to write our best content. Turn that blank page into a full page with Pen Night Radio, where you can get... Uh, quick writing tips and also exclusive interviews with some really amazing people. Um, alrighty. So back to you. <laughs> Thank you. I think something urgently that I would like the audience to know is um, that there's no limit. There's no age limit to start mm -hmm. writing, to start publishing, to put a book out there. Um, there there's just no, no one is keeping time, mm -hmm. but yourself. <laughs> Yes. Uh, going back to the topic of branding, um, sometimes I feel like branding is rushed because we mm -hmm. just want to put the book out there and we want to sell copies and we want people to get excited about our books. Um, but I think it's okay to take your time. It's it's mm -hmm. okay to take a couple of years to brand or even more if you need to. <laughs> it's okay to take a break from writing and refine uh, your branding or redefine it or actually work on it because like Alec and I said, um, we we didn't do that the first time and then we had to uh, reverse engineer our whole brand mm -hmm. process. So like, mm -hmm. it's okay, no one's keeping time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, if you can drive not in reverse, yeah. that is what we recommend. <laughs> yeah. Just so, take your time. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, aside from conceiving your brand and writing down your brand and putting it into your, you know, bios and into your stories wherever possible. Um, what are some other um, helpful tools for branding? Other helpful tools from branding? Um, I think you have to keep in mind your brand in everything that you do. Mm. Everything, even if it's reels, uh, like if you are an Instagram or on TikTok, follow the trends but translate them into your brand. For example, I see a trend and I try to find a way to relate it back to sci-fi or back to my heritage or something that has to do with my brand. Um, also remember that your brand is not gonna be just one thing. You are the brand. So it's not gonna be just your genre. It's not gonna be just uh, your message or your why. It's gonna be all of those things together. So I always try to put your brand in everything that you do whether that's, you know, weekly posts or reels or TikToks or your newsletter, your website, um, just put your brand in everything. Mm, I love that. And in terms of like the visual mediums, you know, you mentioned reels, right? There's like, you know, posters, there's postcards, there's merchandising, right? Um, which some of which can be pretty expensive. Uh, we used mm -hmm. to do a little bit more merchandising than we did last year because last year funds were a little tighter, just as, as an example. But, you know, have any of those tools, have you found any of those tools to be uh, helpful or do you find them more of a hindrance? Oh, man, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, 
marketing is the vein of my existence um it's it's hard it's hard um because i think as as any author i think indie authors suffer a little bit more from this but um that's not to say that traditionally published authors don't uh suffer from having to market themselves and you know put content out there and keep their audiences engaged unless you are Gillian Flynn or George R. R. Martin. I mean, they're mm. just big enough that they don't need to market or connect to anyone. They can just publish a book every 10 years and, you know, sell thousands of copies. But we are not them, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we got to market ourselves. And my advice there is to find as many free tools as you can. Um, there are many free tools uh, to start experimenting once you're sure on what you want to do and how you want to do it and what your process of marketing is going to look like, then you can start spending your money there. Um, whether that's a website, I think my website has been my biggest help. Um, my it's, it's been my biggest media. Um, I get a lot of, of my sales done through my website, which means I get to keep all the profit. Um, so think about that when you're creating a website don't create just a landing page but maybe you want to create an online store where your audience can buy your books from um don't but that's not to say that you don't want to get your book into amazon and everywhere else you want to get your book everywhere your product Mm -hmm. needs to be everywhere um other great tool has been uh social media instagram has been a great friend of mine Mm -hmm. um also an enemy because you know the algorithm (laughs) changes every week (laughs) Oh my lord, that's but, a whole other episode. <laughs> yes, yeah, it, it is. But it's um, it's been it's been a huge help to jump on the trends and jump on the changes changes when they come. Um, that's that's a good way to get your to get a chance to engage with a bright, larger audience. Um, so if you are afraid, for example, of doing reels or TikToks but most of your audience is on Instagram and TikTok. Just do it. Mm-hmm. Just, I, I was ashamed um, of doing it. I, I felt ridiculous making reels and making lives and like, ah, oh, who do I think I am? I'm not an influencer. I can't do that. Uh, no, yes, you can. Yes, you can. It's mm-hmm. okay. Um, maybe you'll feel a little silly at the beginning, but you get used to it. You get used to it you get used to making content and then you become good at it and Mm -hmm. people start to like it. Um, Maybe not everybody, but also remember your content is not for everybody. So it's okay if a few people don't like it, as long as you see that your audience, your main audience is enjoying it. So just, just do it. Just put, just post a reel, post the TikTok, post the selfie. It's okay. (laughs) We're all doing it. Mm -hmm. We sure are. We sure are. It's it's become the nature of the business. It was the same for me. I was very resistant to uh, TikTok. And as it stands, I only do about a reel a week um, because I noticed that um, I was running out of things to reel about. So I tried to see if I could space them out and make sure that the reel itself was something marketable, such as reading a page or, you know, something or other. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Everybody, everybody does it differently. And um, as they say, someone out there needs your book. Mm-hmm. And another thing that you might want to might want to do. Some people are better than others. Um, I am terrible at it. I need to actually get better at it. Just ask for the sale. Ask your mm-hmm. audience to buy your book once a week. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's been proven. Uh, I don't have the stats in front of me, but I think uh, the saying is that someone needs to see your product seven times before they buy it. Um, so. Mm. Publish, size your book at least once a week. Don't let it be everything that you do because that gets old pretty fast and that's how you lose followers and that's how you lose interest. Mm-hmm. Uh, but do it at least once a week and ask for the sale. Just just do it. It's fine. People yes. will go to your website and buy your book. Eventually. Yes, that is great <laughs> advice. And I can't believe I made it this far into an interview without representing. I represent One True Promotion. Pen Night Radio is sponsored by One True Promotion, which is an alliance of authors dedicated to promoting and marketing you. And one of the things that uh, we always add is running ads. Amazon ads have made a significant uh, difference in all of our careers here at One True Promotion. So um, 
We actually offer uh, some tips and tricks for ad school, thanks to Mr. Andrew Bast, who is uh, the chief operating officer here, uh, right here at One True Promotion. So if you follow us, you can get tips on that as well. And yes, as Michelle is saying, uh, don't be afraid to ask for a sale, just not too often, because you don't want to be that guy out on the out on the lawn with the sign over his head, that <laughs> walking up and down the street. That was a trap that I fell into a couple years back, but thankfully we're not there anymore. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> hey, we've all, we've all done it. I went to a party yeah. with books in my purse because maybe someone will want to buy them. Yeah. Um, it didn't happen, but I'm not there anymore. So you know, it oh, happens. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> Oh yeah, mine are stored in the trunk. Wherever I am, I'm like, well, I got one in the trunk. <laughs> you want one? Yes, exactly. I know. Exactly. I know. Same. Yes. You never know. <sighs> I'm sorry. I I, I, th I thought I thought you were going to add something. <laughs> no, I just said you never know. Um, oh yes. Yeah. I guess another thing, if you are like me and you happen to be bilingual. Don't knock out the possibility of translating your books and selling them in another language. Um, mm -hmm. That has helped tremendously. I have been able to translate both of my books into Spanish, and I have been able to do tours in Mexico for my books. So it's uh, it's been great. So don't knock it out. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, don't knock out anything. You know, whatever yeah. tools that you have at your disposal are tools that can help you get a sale. We are 60 minutes into this discussion. How has it been for you? It's been great. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Sometimes I do something very mean and I sideswipe authors with this. So please do not uh, feel any pressure to say yes. But would you like to um, share any uh, of your manuscript with us tonight, today? Oof, my manuscript. Either, either one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like looking for my books because I don't have them near me. But yes. That is okay because because we can we can go away for a minute and that is a uh, uh, perfectly okay. If you would like to do a short reading, we can certainly be ready for you uh, by the time we get back. Absolutely, thank you. Wonderful. All right, so folks, we are going to take a very short break here on Drop a Line. You know the drill. Uh, when we're back, I'll do a couple of uh, promos, and after that, you will be treated to an excellent reading by an excellent author, Michelle Monarez. See you in a minute. See you in a. Real quick again, folks, you are listening to Pen Night Radio. Pen Night Radio is a podcast that was started by One True Promotion so that we could help you slay your inner demons and turn that blank page into a full page by confronting whatever might be holding you back today. We draw from personal experience. I tell stories from my many years of publishing that have held me back over the years, and we help you to confront those same issues with a little bit more help. Uh, slaying demons is also the theme of... The Calipar, The Children of Ark, which is book one in the Calipar series, all about a demon slayer who is fighting in a, the dystopian world of mankind's predator who are coming to the town of Ark for the very first time. But I'm not going to say too, too much about that because that is not the series that we're hearing from tonight. Folks, if you are interested in representation and science fiction, specifically representation for Mexican or Latinx Americans, if you want to hear true stories told by marginalized communities in a genre that is all about pushing things forward, then you are in the right place with this author because I tell you, she has it down to a science. I read the first sentence and I have already bought the book. So without further ado, here she is uh, to read. What are we reading tonight? 
Uh, we're reading from the second book because that's the one that I was able to pull out. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, this is an in-universe story. It's uh, loosely related to the first book that I published. It's called Fabulous Texas and is the story of a town that uh, disappears after a um, violent crime uh, shakes up the community of Fabulous Texas. Um, so I will be reading from that. Um, Wonderful. Do I have a time limit? Oh, a couple of minutes, no. you know, okay. however, however long. All righty. Wonderful. All right. Okay. So here we go. Uh, this is Fabulous Texas by Michelle Monarres. Uh Another summer day. Chapter one. Another slow summer day rolls by with a heat so intense, not even the flies have the will to buzz around. Jim's gas station is the only landmark between the Texas deserts, emptiness, and civilization for at least 70 miles. Both Van Horn and Fabulous are too far away for anyone to pass by his location and decide against pumping gas. But even then, this summer dry heat is proving to be the slowest season his business has ever seen. All week long, his only customers have been sweaty truckers in need of, a, in need of fuel in a bathroom break. No one else wants to travel in this July heat. The register thinks it's cash draw opener. A big gulp, a dollar hot dog with cheese, and a moon pie is his first sale of the week. 350, Jim dries the sweat off his face with an old handkerchief before taking a crumpled five from the grumbly truck rear on the other side of the counter. By the time he hands the man his cash, the sweat returns to his forehead. A sigh gets stuck in Jim's chest. More days like this, and he'd have to tell Johnny, his helper, not to come in next week. He pays the kid minimum wage, three whole dollars, and an hour that he's already spent on a fancy new cassette Walkman to mop the floors, clean the bathrooms, and watch over the register anytime Jim needs a break. With no customers, It'd be hard to keep the lights on and harder yet to pay Johnny. As Jim hopes the trucker's roadside meal doesn't turn into his only sale of the day, a racket outside calls his attention. A girl laughing, perhaps. Jim exchanges a quick glance with the trucker. How odd is it to hear any sort of life signs this far away from civilization? Too odd not to check it out. Johnny, mind the register, will ya? Followed by the trucker, Jim steps outside to investigate. The heat outside rubs Jim of his breath. The white sunlight hurts his eyes as he contemplates the scenery. It waves by over the cracked pavement of I-10, making the highway look like a clear river leading to the towering monument that is Chispa Mountain. When in his cracked lips, Jim shields his eyes with a huge palm, looking for the source of the commotion. A group of three, no, four teenagers lean towards them. Three girls hold a boy as if to help him walk. Jim squints, trying to make out where the teens are coming from. Perhaps their car broke down and they're coming to get gas from him. There could have been an accident and these kids need help, but Jim has lost the ability to move. Doubt freezes him in place. They're all wearing what looks like nightgowns and walking barefoot over the searing highway. Is this some sort of joke? What in the hell? The trucker whispers next to Jim. One of the girls, the brunette with brown skin and the only one dressed in a mint gown, spots them. She waves her free hand and screams something. Jim can't make out what she's saying. Cold sweat trickles down Jim's back. Something's wrong. He manages to make, to take an uncertain step forward, realizing then he's waited too long to do something. The teens look over their shoulder and attempt to pick up the pace. All, the, all of them are screaming now, and Jim finally makes out what they're saying. Help us, help us, please. A loud bang breaks the desert's silence. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. The man next to Jim drops his big gulp in surprise. Jim's heart skips a beat. He takes half notice of the big red big gulp all over his steps. 
Thick and hand thoughts of flies and bees swar swarming over those sticky remains passed through his mind for an instant. Jim's focus is snatched by the, by the side of the black Chevy van speeding from somewhere in the desert. He doesn't have time to think about the truckers rushing over to his trailer to find cover to leave. Jim's too busy recognizing another series of loud bangs coming from the van, gunshots. His whole legs spring into action. The bell on the door dings as Jim rushes back inside. Jim, Johnny, call the cops down at Fabulous. Jim rushes behind, behind the counter. Stay inside, and if something happens, I want you to hide in the bare fridge, you hear? With bulging eyes, Johnny lifts the receiver of the phone hanging on the wall. What's going on? Jim pulls his shotgun and a box of shells. Someone's shooting at some kids. Back outside, the van reaches the highway and swerves on contact with the asphalt. With the trail of dust behind it, it drives like a demon out of hell towards the children. More loud gunshots fire across I-10. Ah, oh, hell. Jim fumbles with his ammo while looking up at the scene. Perhaps it's the shock or the sun in, its, in his eyes. But Jim could swear the bullets keep ricocheting away from the teens as if they were inside of a bubble. Jim shakes his head, chalking it up to another mirage. With shaky hands, he tries to load his gun. He's gone. When was the last time he had used it? A few months back, he fired a single shot through the night to scare coyotes away before taking Johnny back to his house. When had he ever shot something so far away? Never. Oh, shit, shit. The rounds slip out of his hands and fall to the ground. He does his best to retrieve them. He steals a quick glance at the scene in front of him. The van has caught up with his targets. Two men in black suits climb down the van, guns pointed at the kids. Get in. One of the men screams loud enough for Jim to hear. Nausea wills up on the back of his throat. Ignor ignoring sweat falling from his forehead into his eyes, Jim manages to load the gun. Hey, leave him alone. His shotgun cracks as, the pump, as he pumps the ammo into the chamber. With shaky aim, Jim witnesses the brunette in the mint gown stand in front of the other three kids. She puts a hand in front of her. The movement is solid, like a declaration. Enough, the jester says. Two well-aimed shots explode in the Texan desert. The thud of a body against the hot asphalt reaches Jim. The shrill scream of another girl fills him with dread. He drops his gun just as his heart drops to his feet. Too late. He would have never made that shot. The black van speeds away, taking the three surviving teens. Jim sits down on his steps, smearing his cargo shorts with red big gulp. A heavy weight settles over his shoulders. He searches and finds his voice again. He calls for Johnny. Where the hell are the cops? Did you call them? Jim asks when the kid peers from behind the glass door. I call them, Jim. Johnny's voice drifts, drifts in, small and distant. Sweet Jesus, is she dead? A breeze rolls across the highway. Jim lifts his gaze to look at the girl on the ground as if he needed confirmation of what he already knows. Movement catches his eyes and he stands up. Is that the girl moving or was just the wind, the sudden breeze lifting her mint gown? Jim rushes to the girl, call an ambulance. That's it. Wow. <laughs> Love it. My that was goodness. <laughs> my goodness. Thank you for reading the whole chapter. My my goodness. That's another page turner. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh my goodness. You know, we talked so much before we close out the show. Like we talked so much about, you know, why you write and what you write about. But, you know, how did you um, you know, develop your talent for, you know, being so um captivating? <laughs> um, I think it comes from a lot of uh critique partners. Um mm. this book would not be what it is today if I hadn't run it through several critique groups and several editing rounds. Um, you know, it pays to have a developmental editor. It pays to have a critique <laughs> partner. Um, so that's 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 how. <laughs> By Excellent. having other people's help. 
Exactly. And I can attest to that as well, although I didn't uh, read anything tonight. So we'll see what that help was worth. But um, seriously, though, that's that's what does it. Uh, that's incredible. Uh, Michelle, it has been just extraordinary talking to you today. Thank you. I, yeah. I've been very happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been of a blast. Course. Of course. And you're welcome back anytime. We've had a guest come on uh, six times uh, before. So uh, oh. we, we definitely have recurring guests whenever you have an update, whenever you have a new book out, whenever you want a quick promotional spot, uh, this platform is always available to you. Before we go, yeah. how um, how best can we support you? So how best can you support me? You can support me by following me on my social media, Michelle Munares author, um, or you can go to my website, sign up for my newsletter, or even better, you could actually buy my books at my website. It's uh, michellemunares.com slash buy. Uh, that's where you can find your books or you can find me anywhere, anywhere you buy your books, Barnes and Nobles, Amazon, anywhere in the globe. So that's how you best can support me. Excellent. You heard it straight from the source, folks. Anywhere that sells books, look for Michelle Monares. Do you have any closing remarks for your listeners? Yes. Um, I was very happy to be here. I hope that um, what we discussed today helps you with your brand. And uh, if you have questions about branding, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. I can be reached out at Michelle at michellemonares.com. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions and uh, lead also tell you where you can find the mentors that helped me get my brand where it's at today. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, it goes right with the one true promotion mission yeah. statement. It's always great to meet a kindred spirit. Uh, Michelle, this has been awesome. I hope you have a pleasant, wonderful Thank and inspiring you. rest of your day. You are welcome back anytime. Thank you, Alec. Thank you so much. My Bye. pleasure. Folks, that concludes Drop a Line. We'll be back later to close the show. Was that something or what, folks? Honestly, one of my favorite discussions yet. I was very happy she agreed to be on, and I hope it left you feeling inspired, especially if you are someone who is struggling with brand making, especially if you are somebody who is part of a marginalized community and wants to get your voice out there. There's just so much wisdom that Michelle has to teach. So thank you for listening for to another episode of Pen Night Radio. To hear more about how we expand on this topic, I invite you to check out previous episodes of the podcast and send your own thoughts to Alec Pangea Author on Instagram or Instagram Threads or Alec Pangea Drop a Line or the Calipar fans on Facebook. Stay engaged with the podcast for your chance to appear as a guest and talking partner during a future episode that tackles your favorite topic. With all that said, Knights, it's time to go out to battle. Right on. <laughs>